Okay, we're back actually with slide 16, which looks at child deaths by socio-economic class. Um, socio-economic classifications on the bottom, uh, up, up this end is the uh, more affluent, whereas this end is the less well affluent. And there's three indicators here, uh, deaths of pedestrians, deaths of car occupants, and cyclists. Uh, so we'll drill down and have a look at these groups. Uh, we'll see these are higher management, low management professionals, intermediates, small employers, and uh, own account owners. Okay, so relatively low. So pedestrian deaths relatively low. Probably because many many more of these children are driven around by cars. Cycling deaths a bit higher. Um, cyclists, I say car occupant deaths a little bit higher. But when we look at a lower socioeconomic category, that is, say people who never worked or long time unemployed. For a start, we see. Um, the numbers who uh, are killed are much higher, and the number of pedestrians are killed are much higher. Again, probably because they don't have cars, um, and quite a few, quite, quite a limited number of cyclists. Okay, um, these are the terms of reference for the uh, Marmot Report. I've highlighted a few keywords. Uh, if you want to pause, uh, pause the video now and have a read of them. Uh, the keywords uh, I would suggest we want to think about or identify. Identify what the issues are, look for the evidence, uh, provide advice, uh, and then report on a regular basis. And I think they're a, a pretty good uh, set of criteria for any major public health initiative. Okay, prior to MAM, the main focus was the inequalities in mortality. Uh, the MAM report expanded the indicators to, as they put it, promote and sustain fair distribution of well being as well as health. So this led to other factors. Uh, such as disability free life expectancy being considered for the first time. Um, the idea of life course is key to Marmot, uh, not least because of the evidence that inequalities do accumulate through life. We start off with, with uh, being disadvantaged, these uh, disadvantages accumulate as you get older. Um, individual development takes place from birth to death, uh, certainly, and epigenetic, epigenetics suggests that this is also true of pregnancy and probably preconception as well. Okay, so these are the life course stages identified by Marmot. Uh, one of the key concepts, as I mentioned, of the review is that disadvantage starts before birth and accumulates throughout life. Um, from the perspective of nutritional biochemistry, this is certainly true of prenatal development and arguably the preconception health of the mother. And here we have a classic example, uh, which I may have mentioned in the lectures, the Dutch mothers. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, there was a the Germans uh, abandoned Holland, basically, uh, which was struck by a very bad winter. Uh, the Allies were crossing Europe, chasing the Germans, and the Dutch people were left a bit of a problem. Uh, so it was a major famine, the so-called hunger winter. Uh, now, women who were pregnant during this time unsurprisingly gave birth to children who were of low weight. What was surprising one was 20 or 30 years later, when those children gave birth, their children were also of low weight. Uh, this led to the whole concept of epigenetics, the idea that nutrition and other factors can influence the expression of the genome. Um, I'll probably come back to this in other lectures and maybe a, a video, but that was just there as a little inclusion. Uh, the Dutch mother study was very important. Uh, something else that was discovered while these, this cohort was being studied, uh, not just women, men and children as well, was gluten intolerance. This was the first time it was identified in this particular cohort. Okay, that was a digression. Um, these are the areas of action as defined by Marmot. As we'll see later, the nomenclature in the new public health framework has changed a bit, but the overall approach remains. Um, most of the Marmot Report's key findings were taken on by the new government. A significant difference they didn't expect, except rather, is the concept of a minimum income for healthy living. Um, I'll include some comments from the original Marmot Report here on this. Um, this was a calculation about how much people would need as an income, including factors such as nutrition, uh, exercise, social integration, um, a range of different aspects. Uh, there's some quite complicated question calculations done by people like the, the uh, Roundtree Trust. Uh, so here's the figure they came to. Uh, a core living wage figure of £7.14 an hour, which is a little bit more than the current minimum wage. And for pensioners? Uh, quite a lot more than the current plans, though the government has a, a, a announced an upgrading of pension incomes recently, up, and I honestly can't remember what the new figures are. Okay, moving on. Uh, 
this is a summary of some of the areas of action. Uh, again, read the detail, the report if you're interested in the details. Early years, uh, action to focus on health inequalities must start before birth. So we're talking about things like a good diet, we're talking about things like folic acid and vitamin D and good general nutrition. Uh, school and work, lots to be done and one of the focus of the new approach to public health is workplaces. Um, this is, used to be something that happened in the past a lot, a lot or anywhere. Uh, back in the day when the major employers on Teesside were people like ICI and British Steel, they did a lot of social activities. They organised sports clubs, for example. Uh, when ICI was, I'm going to use the phrase asset trip, because it certainly was, all that sort of thing went away and has now had to be taken on by the public sector. Um, and there is suggestions that perhaps employers may want to bring this sort of thing back, at least for the employees, if not necessarily for their employers, uh, the employees' families. Uh, I have to say, I think that'll be a good thing. Uh, later years, um, promoting the health and independence of, of older people. Important, important from the point of view of dignity of these people, of course, but also because it saves the country money. If we can delay the fact that the time it takes before they need intensive care, uh, this will be a good thing for the country for a number of reasons. Okay, yeah, key key messages from Marmus. Uh, and here they are. I've touched on these issues earlier on, so have a pause, have a read, and read in the Marmot report, starting at page 15, the details of what they are. They're, they're introduced in quite a lot of detail in the in the report. Um, again, have a read of them. Um, they're quite important. Uh, one I'll pick out there in the middle is economic growth is not the most important measure of our country's success. Well, a noble sentiment. It's worth mentioning here the importance of a wide range of stakeholders. The new public health framework includes private sector organisations, such as the food industry, uh, added to an already wide list of stakeholders. I have to say this seems quite reasonable. Include many different sectors of society as possible seems worthwhile. Uh, the question is, how effective will this approach be in improving the outcomes? Okay, uh, a little bit more on the policy objectives. Uh, here's some more from uh, Mount Report, Chapter 4, page 93. Uh, give every child the best start in life. This is These ones that are focused specific, specifically on children. Uh, there's a number of outcomes which come from that. Ensure a healthy living standard for all. And create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities. That's obviously quite a big challenge for this country. And strengthen the role and impact of ill health pr prevention. So take a moment to have a read of the Marmot Report and draw your own conclusions about how it, the importance of these and how they can be delivered. Uh, one thing about Marmot is it uses things called smart indicators. Uh, smart objectives are useful. Uh, it's one of those management tools which people like write very long books on, but when you distill them down, they're actually quite straightforward. Uh, smart objectives are quite useful. You can you should definitely be thinking about mapping large bodies of your work, such as your final year projects, and uh, maybe the second year public health and health and health promotion uh, project using smart approaches. It it looks nice and it's a good way of getting extra marks. Uh, it was developed by Gerald Doran in the 1980s. Uh, he was the first to use the monomic, which describes the process used to set objectives in a project. Uh, Marmot uh, report notes a number of indicators are already in place, such as those for the NHS and public health measures, such as London, London Health Observatory's basket of indicators. Uh, we'll have a look at the LHO in a little bit. Um, the report also notes that different indicators may be needed about, across different time scales, and new indicators may, may be needed, and these are likely to change over time as well. Uh, hence the fact that the Marmot report continues to roll on, and will continue to roll on, hopefully into the future. Okay, here's some examples of the type of interventions that have happened in the past. Um, sure start, citizens' advice. Uh, there's a video there, which I'm, I'm going to show a, a little bit out of if the video works properly, mostly because this person here is a former student of ours, uh, now working as a teacher. Um, this was about the health, the video was about the Healthy Eating Initiative in Darling, and it's on the Northern Echoes website, and I hope they won't mind if I steal a, a few, about 30 seconds, just to have Kelly talking about uh, what she did. So we'll move on and we'll find that. There we go. The Community Nutrition Pilot Programme has been a fantastic opportunity for me just to um, learn about more about nutrition and health and also just to share it with my community um, and get 
hands-on experience whilst at university. Okay, it's a little bit more of that video if you want to go and have a look at this. Well worth having a look at too. It was a nice initiative and it's a good video from the Northern Echo. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, I'm not going to look at all of these. Uh, this is the uh, indicators for healthy and sustainable places and communities. Uh, there's a number of there which we, we can talk about in detail. I'm, I'm just going to have a look at active travel. Again, you should dig into the report if you're interested. Um, Here's a quote, um, transport significantly contributes to some of today's greatest challenges to public health in England. The burden of road traffic injuries, physical inactivity, the adverse effect of traffic on social uh, cohesiveness and the impact of outdoor air and noise pollution. Um, active transport is something which would involve walking or cycling, has the potential to contribute significantly to improvements in health. However, it's quite hard to implement. Uh, the Marmot Report notes that Department of Transport figures uh, showing that the number of 5 to 10 year olds children walking from school fell in the past few years. And I've got, I've got some graphs here which we'll, we'll, which we'll, we'll have a look on on the next page. Uh, okay, uh, so here is primary school children. Uh, I'll, I'll assume this on one out when I produce the video. Uh, the yellow section here and the little brownie section here are walking or bicycling. Uh, that isn't caravan. Um, so someone in the lecture the day said she wondered why 43% of people were going to school in a, in a caravan. Uh, it's just not, not very clear, but it isn't caravan honest. Uh, so primary school children taking walking and bicycling together, 48%. Secondary school children walking and bicycling, bicycling together, 38%. So a 10% difference between the two groups. Um, CO2 and uh, carbon emissions are an important part of the report and the one thing I'll point out here is that transport has remained effectively steady over the basically past 20 years of these data which is possibly not a good thing. Okay, super output areas. We've discussed this before in another lecture, the lecture on data visualization but I just thought I'd include a few reminders. Uh, where do we get them from? Uh, we can have a look at how to obtain this information if we go over to the ONS website. Um, oops. Sorry, I've got myself a little bit lost here. Uh, ONS website. Have to bear with me for a second. Okay, Office of National Statistics. Sorry, it took me a little while to find that. Uh, if you want to find out information about any local authority, uh, you just you can just stick a postcode in here. So we'll go TS1 3BA Universities postcode. Click on search. It'll bring up a basket of different indicators. Okay, it's found out where we are. Uh, total deprivation. That's the least. That's the most. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to come and look at these statistics a bit, a little bit later on. And uh, there's various things you look at. You look at the uh, number of uh, break up down of people who live there. So age, for example, that is persons age 15 to persons age over 65. Lots of useful information. You look at health. Um, again, lots of lots of indicators. So this is looking at life expectancy at birth. Uh, the dark blue is Middlesbrough. The rest is England. And as you can see, we are significantly worse in both categories. Okay, so we'll we'll move on a bit from that. Uh, OK, here's a nice visualisation we've seen before, and I think it's worth showing again. Uh, I've lost that again. I've got hundreds of things open, which is why. What basically uh, this guy, Dan Vickers, did was map so super output areas onto uh, geographical information, uh, something which, in historical times, a few years ago, would have probably taken NASA to do. Uh, we can now do it very straightforwardly. One of the final year students did an excellent project on food deserts, and we actually did a lot of geomapping just using a mobile phone. Uh, so there's indications there of which sort of socioeconomic category there they are. If we drill right down to the town centre, we can have a little look. Um, the appear in a little moment. Uh, just my the internet catching up. Uh, so there's there's the university, there's Albert Park, and there's a region just south of Albert Park, uh, which is sort of blue colory type area. Uh, the colours don't quite match on my computer for some reason. But that's a sort of nice thing we can do with data visualisation, which is why I included that again in here. Okay, so I'll go back to the where we were. Nice. Uh, all right, 
finish for only one. OK, and there's two lowers, layers of output areas. And there's a middle layer, there's 7,193 in this country, with an average population of about 7,200. Now the point is, compared to previous measures, this is a consistent average population. Um, there's 34,000 lower super, super out, lower layer super output areas, built from the 2001 census data, with an average population of about 1,500. Um, and then you go down to wards. Um, data isn't routinely published at this level. Okay, I'm going to have to stop again now because I'm running out of time.